Hello Jags, this is Tom Joy. Welcome to the very first episode of our Jaguar Media Weekend Roundtable Discussion. You've seen what we've done here with some videos recently where we cover a single stock or idea. I wanted to come together as a team for a discussion with Fahad and talk about what we see in the market this upcoming week, what will work, what ideas we have. I hope you'll find this interesting, useful, and like everything we do here, actionable. Welcome, Fahad. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. You know, this discussion roundtable, we hope that to continue this um, going forward from here, you'll find this a little bit different than what you have been seeing in the Jaguar media so far. Um, I hope to cover many aspects of the market, many different stocks, and uh, the discussions here will lead to sometimes more broad-based, sometimes very specific catalyst insight. So let's take a look at a couple of things in our hand. Great. Let's get started here. I want to talk about casinos. We were in Las Vegas twice last year, uh, AAII conference in October, the Traders Expo conference in November. In both of those trips, we talked about specifically how Macau GGR we saw slowing in Q3 of 18 was just a bump in the road, not a longer term cyclical trend. In fact, I remember we were sitting in the taxi looking at Wynn outside, pulled up the chart on your phone and you, it had gone from 200 to 94 bucks. And I remember you said, at this rate, it'll be zero soon. Yeah. And I mean, it was just such a great deal. I know a lot of you made money on that. Uh, the stock is up 35% since then. LVS also is up 32% since then. And it's been a great run. I wanted to start off talking about casinos today because this earnings season has also been very strong. And while we usually look at Macau GGR for growth, if you look at Las Vegas GGR, it was up 5.7% year over year in December. This had the effect of bringing overall Q4 RevPAR in Las Vegas up over 2%, which was much better than expected. Here's a couple other highlights. Q4 market-wide Las Vegas gaming revenues up 7% year over year. Q4 Vegas RevPAR up nearly 10% year over year. We had channel checks expecting a 6% gain. And Q4 Vegas overall visitations were up 3% year over year, confirmed by strong traffic seen at McCarran Airport. So here's what we have, strong fundamentals, technicals pointing to the upside for the group, and option order flow in gaming sector in general has also been quite strong. Does this running casino have more legs? I think so, Tom. Um, you know, there's several factors in play over here. And I'll go dive into a couple of those one by one. But I think in big picture, we have to start off from Macau and then transition a little bit into, into Las Vegas to see what we are seeing. Now, a couple things that, stand, that stood out for me, because it's not just the channel checks that, that we are getting, that we got for Q4 and then we saw them translate into strong earnings for Q4, but it's Q1 as well. Number one, so far we have the month of January and partial data from February available and the room rate survey is pointing to 13% growth in Q1, which is sequentially further improvement than what we saw in Q4. So it's already coming in well ahead of expectations. So I think that bodes positively for the upcoming Q1 earnings report sometime in April. But more importantly, let's go back to Macau for a second. What really happened in Macau was back in September, there was a typhoon. Okay. that simply swept across the entire island, knocked the power down completely, and as a result, the entire island was closed for 10 days. And then even when that opened, there was a lot of cleanup work that was required, the traffic basically died, and that caused the Q3 right. uh, GGR to basically just come down crashing. We used to see run rate in the mid-teens percentage, you know, in the first half of 2018, and then it just dipped to 8%, then it dipped to just merely 2% year over year. So I think as a result, many people thought that this was related to a significant slowdown, but it was really just a temporary bump on the road, you know, particularly driven by weather. And I think that's why wind came down so hard from 400 to 94. And that's when we made that joke that at the speed it's coming down, right five more months and the stock will be zero. It reminded me of another situation from several years ago. Um, one of the best buying opportunities in Wynn Resorts came, this was 2014, I believe it was, when the stock was trading at $60 per share. And I remember Steve Wynn coming in, doing, announcing a massive insider purchase of uh, about $65 million. 
And that's when we, that year in 2014, we made win as a top pick for the clients. And it turned out to be the fantastic opportunity because over the course of next couple of years, stock went all the way to 200. This decline has been of similar magnitude. Now, Steve Wynn hasn't stepped in, but at 94, looking at where the growth is in comparison to what it was doing back in 2014, just seemed like just unnecessary too low, just overshot to the downside. And that's why we made that as top pick in both AAII and the uh, Traders Expo conference in Las Vegas. A couple other things that I want to point out. You know, um, the same month when the typhoon was sweeping through across the island, this very much anticipated, uh, they want to call it the eighth wonder of the world, uh, the bridge, 40-mile bridge that connects three major towns, the Hong Kong, the, the, the Zuai, and the Macau Island together. That opened also in September. And as a result, the traffic basically improved sharply. Now you have all the mainland people that want to come in from, from uh, mainland uh, China to Macau. It used to take them three hours by ferry, and now they can get there in less than 30 minutes. Um, similarly, the traffic coming in from Hong Kong has now sharply improved. So all of that has had quite a bit of positive impact on the growth. So we saw then GGR that dipped down to 2%, came back up 5%. 6% and the most recent numbers are coming out well, you know, back into teens. So as a result, these stocks has started to perform. Um, I do also want to point out just one more thing that is uh, significant over here. There was a, you know, uh, you know, we have seen some significant amount of upside call buying taking place in this group. I have a picture over here that comes from the newly created Jaguar scan. Uh, we started picking up some very heavy upside call acc accumulation in when going into earnings. And the response post earnings was pretty good. We saw the stock spike higher uh, and then, you know, consolidated in a bull flag for a couple days and now it's starting to take a new leg higher. But it wasn't just when. Las Vegas Sands had a $5 million call purchase in deep in the money leap call options, high delta high price contracts and that also remains in the open interest just looking at the jaguar scan just last friday we're talking february 22nd over here here's a screenshot that i have over here and it goes to show the consistent heavy call accumulation that was taking place in both win and las vegas particularly in april month and when we saw 8,000 contracts that go off and now i expect this to be reflected in the open interest on Monday as well. Um, you know, so what should be the short-term catalyst? Technically, these stocks are already working so well. Uh, next week on March 1st, on Friday, we're going to get the February GGR report. You know, it always surprises me a little bit how fast Chinese are in putting their macro data together, supposedly. You know, that as soon as the midnight happens, they basically have the data available. So, uh, uh, you know, the February month is going to end on Thursday and sometime before even market opens on Friday morning, you're going to get the uh, Macau GGR report for, for, for February. And ahead of that, last week, we saw call buyers in both Las Vegas Sands as well as win. So that could serve as another major catalyst. And the last thing, this is going to be a bit more long term in nature. It's not just the strength on the strip in Vegas where we are seeing it. We are also and, and the Macau regional casinos are seeing much better growth. In fact, a couple of weeks ago in one of the webinars, we discussed um, El Dorado Resorts, symbol ERI, and also in the Jaguar Q1 outlook, we pointed uh, a bull case for uh, uh, PENN. Um, similar kind of uh, positive checks are also coming for MGM, which also has a lot of regional properties as well as Las Vegas sense. The, the reason simply for that is sports betting is now starting to take off. Now, this was after the Supreme Court legalized the sports betting back in June of last year. And gradually, you're starting to see that trickle down impact with sports betting revenues are simply coming in at in 30s and 40s percentage for practically all regional casinos that are opting to go into that business. Penn is an inter interesting one, P-E-N-N, because this is the only regional casino we have identified so far that actually has not signed yet any contract with an online operator to basically allow 
the, uh, the, the online sports betting to take off. Others have already. So that's another specific catalyst that remains in play for that particular stock. Overall, I agree. Uh, one last thing I will add to the, uh, to the, to the bull case over here for casinos. Uh, back in when, when, when there were trade tensions between U.S. and China were sharply increasing. There was a moment uh, in early January when the PBOC, the People's Rep uh, Bank of China, injected in a single shot $84 billion into the system. And then immediately after that, uh, sometime I think it was on January 31st, we saw China announce a $370 billion of economic stimulus package. Let's put them all together, over $450 billion worth of money printing has been on a full swing basically since the start of the year to basically stem China from falling into a recession given that we have all these trade you know, tensions going on between US and China. There was a very interesting research paper that was issued by Credit Suisse in around February 15, a few weeks after all this injection, money injection came into the system and it looked at a, 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 the correlation between the Macau GGR growth as well as the, uh, the money supply growth in China. And there's about nine months to 12 month correlation between the two as when we see basically the, uh, a little bit of an uptick in the credit formation with a ninth month lag, you see sharp acceleration in basically gambling in Macau. And so I think we're going to see that again. This is not going to be something that's going to start appearing immediately in the next couple of months. But I think that at this pace, if the money printing continues, the injection continues, by the end of 2019, you'll be seeing some tremendous growth rate. I think you could see the GGR return to mid-teens um, mid growth and then potentially just stay there for quite some time until this entire credit formation basically trickle down through the system. Thanks, Fahad. You know, you're right. You mentioned the Jaguar scan. We're actually picking up heavy bullish flow in Wynn, LVS, even MGM to some degree, but especially the casinos that are tied to Macau. So let's stay with this Chinese theme. Let's look at the elephant in the room here. There's an ETF in China, ASHR, which tracks their CSI 300 index. ASHR was up 3% on the session on Friday. It's running strong. There's also many Chinese growth stocks that we like a lot. IQ and IO are good examples. It run hard last week. In fact, you also saw NIA, NIO covered this week on CBS on 60 Minutes. In fact, if we pull up the ratio chart to show relative performance of ASHR versus SPY, that's also breaking out to a new 52-week high. Put this differently in perspective. This chart shows that while S&P is up 11.5% year-to-date in 2019, this basket of Chinese stocks represented by ASHR is up 20.7% year-to-date in 2019. We look at this market in the U.S. and often say how strong this rally has been this year, but Chinese stocks so far have posted twice as much gain as the U.S. This is incredible growth. And I think the part I find perhaps even most fascinating is that many of these Chinese growth stocks we covered in the chat room last week, they're still not anywhere near their summer 2018 highs. Many of these are just starting to break out from the base. So technically that would support the logic that they still have room to run. Can you put all this in perspective for us, considering the 90-day negotiation period that's going to end on March 1st? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Now, you see, there is no question that the, the, the March 1st 90-day period, when it's going to end between the U.S. and China negotiation next Friday on, uh, on March 1st, it's going to be potential a market-moving event. But let's focus on why these Chinese stocks have been so strong so far. What's been the main theme, main reason behind them? You know, we discussed earlier that Chinese are, are, they are the best in printing money. You know, we complain a lot about it in the United States with the whole Federal Reserve zero interest rate policies and all kinds of quantitative easing programs in the, in, in the back. Let me ask you a question. Take a guess, total random guess. How much money do you think Chinese have printed since 2008 Great Recession? A trillion dollars. Oh my gosh, you'll be so far out off the mark. From four trillion to 18 trillion dollars. Wow. 14 trillion dollars is what they have printed since the end of 2008 Great Recession. You see, this is a cycle that is playing out across globally in all the countries where 
the idea what any time when you get any kind of little bit softness in any kind of macro environment, the central banks immediately go rush to basically pressing control P on the keyboards to basically print money. And it's been happening in the US as well, but to a far lesser extent, much more in Europe and Chinese and Japanese are off the chart. Now we can sit here and we can talk about the merits of this and what the end consequences for all of this is. Um, and it's really not going to lead the discussion to anything actionable. But what I can tell you is that the, what I have noticed over so many years of following the central bank's decision, particularly in Asia, in China particularly, is that uh, the socialist regime is, tends to have much more, there's, there tends to be much better allocator of capital to the spots of the economy where it needs the most. Hence, the effects of their actions tends to be far more, far more aggressive and active than how we have been able to do in the United States. Now, the thing is that can this continue? And will this be, is this the, is this the better sense essentially that we're going to go forward from here on the same path? Absolutely it will. But I think there's, there's no denying the Chinese have been far, far better, better allocator of money than, than we have seen in the past. Hold on here a second though. You're not arguing that socialism is actually a better system. No, 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 I'm not arguing this at all. I, uh, there's no question that the, f that the laissez fair, the, the, the free market uh, society that we have in the United States is still far better system than anybody else. But I think you have to at least acknowledge that China has been able to do this for 30 years, 25, 30 years, and as a result was able to bring 700 million of their people out of poverty into what is now considered a middle class. So there's some merit there. Now, one can Fair argue, point. okay, but they also went from $4 trillion to $18 trillion in money printing. Absolutely, no question about it. But would you rather have the jobs for these people? Wouldn't you rather have the growing economy that came as a result of this? So I'm just simply making a case and observation here. The Chinese have been far better allocator from top-down approach of the money, which is sort of like a distribution of mechanism that wouldn't work over here. Um, you know, another thing that I will mention is about this is that is coming back to the March 1st deadline, the 90-day window that's coming to end. What is the base case scenario? Let's just, let's, just, let's just cut out the noise and just look at what the base case scenario is for, for this Friday. The base case scenario is that we are going to uh, get some sort of a watered down deal. And the two big pieces of this deal is going to be Chinese opting to buy more of US crude oil as well as agricultural product. What was the number that was thrown around in the last week? Yeah, we've heard rumors that it's $1.2 trillion, but those are easy for them. Oil and agriculture, that's easy. That's yeah. not addressing IP theft, which is really the, the issue at the heart of this. And exactly, and, and, and you know, there's no question about it, because, but how will the market react to this? I guess that's come down to the question. You know, the way I look at it, neither country at this point can afford to lose any more political capital. Right. Right? I mean, the Chinese economy is slowing. The data is right there. So they cannot risk not making a deal and then watching their economy fall apart further. The risk to China is that any further accelerating deterioration could cause some sort of credit crunch at a time when they're trying to print money, and that will be devastating. On the U.S. side, it's sort of similar. You know, Trump has his ways to be able to shore up his base um, despite being able to basically tangle a lot of situations that may sound, you know, a little bit controversial at times. But a deal that involves $1.2 trillion, if it's true, uh, of more purchases of U.S. crude oil and agricultural product, it's a win. It's a win. It's a major win for, the, for those rest belt states and everybody else. IP will not be resolved. I can assure you that. That's such an important topic and a major topic. It's not a turnkey solution for it. It's just not going to happen. So they're going to buy more time for that particular part. The IP, the forced technology transfer, all those kind of things. Could that issue become an absolute deal breaker where that leads to having no deal at all? $1.2 trillion even, absolutely no deal. Now that's the risk. So my base case scenario over here, and I think this is what you're going to see play out on Friday, is that a Watertown deal that involves more oil, 
more ag products, but no deal on anything else. Do you think that if it's 1.2 trillion, do you think that's already baked in for cat or deer? Not entirely. I think it may actually, we'll see. Because, uh, you know, there's a sense out there that you may see some sort of basically, uh, you know, sell the news kind of a reaction to the market on that. It's possible. Um, but $1.2 trillion is also a lot. At the same time, when the Federal Reserve in the U.S. has now gone completely dovish and the Chinese have printed $370 billion in stimulus just in the last six weeks or so. So I think it may, it, it, you know, this may offset the negatives and the positives and the market just may trade water, just trade water for a while, you know, and just maybe come down a little bit on profit taking, but possibly not a lot. Most important thing is this will be seen as a win. But in reality, and I just want to point this out, uh, you know, the Chinese are playing a long term game here. They have the patience we don't. You know, politically, if you look at the political capital that the Trump has in his hand with another election year coming up next year, uh, and the line of people basically that are going to stand up against him, um, we're playing a very short-term game. We want to show victory. Chinese can sit through any kind of troubles with the surpluses they have, and they're playing a long-term game here. There will be no solution at the end of, for, at the end of this deal regarding forced technology transfers or IP theft or any of that. The base scenario is simply this, more oil, more egg exports, no, no resolution on IP and force transfer, and the 10% tariff stay in place. The risk is that Trump uses no decision on IP or force technology as a reason to come out stronger and basically raises the tariffs to 25%. That will be devastating for both. I do not put a high probability on that scenario, maybe 10, 15% chance of that. But if that happens, we're looking at a devastating scenario because that will crush the economic, the already slowing down economic data. Um, I think in that scenario, there is this thought out there that the Fed that has now completely gone dovish will be there to backstop it. I just don't know the market will care for it as much. You could have a potential crash scenario in that hand. So uh, we go from 10 to 25 percent is game over. I think you're right. And I hope you're right that we at least get some kind of deal so we can try to put this behind us. Yeah. All right. Switching topics here. Every day after the market closes, I like to go back to the Jaguar scan and, and take a look for where actions built up that day. Something almost always catches my eye. Last Friday, it was Valero, VLO, jumped out at me. We saw large buyers of 8,000 June 90 calls for up to 325. And we've seen a lot of accumulation in January 2021, leap 65 calls since November. It's 6,500 calls uh, accumulated from up to $22 offer. It's a $13 million bullish bet. And look at the chart here. We're consolidating a high volume rally since earnings in January. It's a major air pocket up to 110, which is quite a bit of room to run from 85 here. Listen to this earnings report we saw from Valero on January 21st. EPS 212 versus 110 consensus. Due to record setting refining margin capture of 102% versus 60% average in the past three years. Gross refining margins were up to $11 per barrel, 33% above consensus. They cash flowed 1.67 billion, significantly higher than 112 billion street estimate. Refining operating income 1.5 billion versus 850 million estimate on, on those stronger refining margins. These numbers are off the chart. It's a blow away quarter. Do you think that's all because of IMO 2020 or is there more to this? Not entirely because of IMO 2020, but you're right. This was a off the chart quarter. Um, I was surprised a little bit that time when the earnings came out, maybe because the, uh, it just coincided with a little bit of weakness in the crude oil market that day. The reaction in the stock price wasn't as robust as I was, as I was expecting. But um, I think anybody that pulls up their report, takes a look at it, you, you know, you'll see these numbers were just literally off the chart. Free cash flows, earnings per share, revenue, the, the margin percentage, the realized, the realized profit margins on, these, uh, um, on the growth is, is remarkable. And I agree the chart is also setting up for a breakout. There's really two things going on over here. So I'll just touch upon those things. One has to do with what, what this quarter is telling us and what were the drivers of this major beat. And the second is when that IMO 2020 comes into play. On the first point, you know, one of the things that 
we know about Valero from history is that this company um, has generally been seen in, you know, in old times as a refiner that particularly is involved in the sour crude oil market. Now, for, for those who do not know, there's two types of crude. There is sour crude and there is sweet crude. Sour crude has high sulfur content, so it is more costly to refine and difficult to bring to the market. And sweet crude has low sulfur content, easy to refine and bring to the market. The cost is easy. And while they both sell for pretty much the same price. So naturally, when you have more, when your input cost is residing, is based on, uh, on the sweet crude market, your margins tend to be higher. Valero, uh, historically, has been always a refiner of sour crude. But back in 2015, they started to shift gears. They basically made certain investments in three different kinds of uh, uh, business ventures that are starting to finally pay off. Just a quickly quote from the uh, earnings report. There was a Montreal project that, finished in, that started in 2015 but finished in 2018. There was a Diamond project that goes through Memphis. It was started in late 2017 and also finished in 2018. And then a big one, a Sunrise project that also came... Um, that also became effective and came to, uh, came to business in November 2018. So these three projects, as they come to completion, the revenue mix has shifted. It is no longer a company that is highly dependent on sour crude anymore. It is now dependent on l sweet crude market. And as a result, you're seeing explosion, big explosion versus consensus estimate in the total refining margins. That's what that earnings report shows. Now, I'm going to quote something over here from Bank of America that catches my attention from the, uh, from the review of this earnings report. Valero is not viewed as having the same WTI Brent spread exposure as other refiners. If this proves sustainable, this is a potential game changer for Valero that has otherwise been weighed by perceived exposure to Venezuela and tightening heavy and medium sour differentials on the USGC. Just to clarify there, is Valero the only company to benefit from sweet crude? No, no, there's a, there, there's a lot of other companies. In fact, most of the refining companies actually can, will benefit and they continue to benefit from the sweet crude price being down. Uh, Valero is a unique situation where the, the consensus estimates were so out of line because historically it has always been seen as a sour crude refiner and now as they're shifting those consensus estimates on the street are starting to adjust accordingly and that's why you're seeing the sharp surprise on the earnings speed but what this bank of america uh, comment essentially shows is exactly that that this is a potential game changer for valero and i think that's why the rest of 2019 consensus has also, uh, they have to move higher after this quarter. The second point, now this goes back to IMO 2020. Now, for those who do not know, the International Maritime Organization is an organization that has been voluntarily asking shippers globally, as well as countries to, uh, to basically switch their mar marine shipping emissions from 3.5% to 0.5% and the deadline for that is January 31st, 2020. Now, this may seem like a very small percentage drop going from 3.5% to 0.5%, but in terms of total carbon emissions and the, the work that is necessary is significant move. It's, that's why the U.S. has been a little bit backing away from this as well, even though 180 countries so far have actually already signed up for this voluntarily. Now, according to one of the research reports that came out from Credit Suisse a while back, they did a fantastic study on this and they put all the models together and then they came back and then they said that they expect that this shift from 3.5% to 0.5% emissions will essentially create an incremental demand of up to 2 million barrels of low sulfur sweet crude fuel products. Now, think of it now in the context of what Valero just reported in its earnings report. Valero that was 
in the past has always been seen as a refiner of sour crude products has been shifting its revenue mix by having these new projects that they have been working on since 2015 and now they've been gradually starting to come to completion so it's a perfect timing on the company's part to be prepared essentially to benefit from this two million barrel increase in demand that will come into play by january 2020. Um, so now one of the things also in the Credit Suisse file that it highlights is that uh, we could see refining margins for companies like Valero essentially climb to as high as 15 barrels per day. So that's significant. If you think about it in terms of total volume put through that is coming from increased demand on top of it, higher margins as well. That's the long term bull case. It's not in play yet, but I believe that by the time we start to end 2019, this will become a pretty big boon for all refiners. Reiterate that point. The IMO 2020 Credit Suisse is swing, saying they could push refining margins to $15 per barrel. We just saw a blowout quarter from Valero at eleven dollars per barrel. That's a big change. I know, right? I mean, I mean, think about this for a second. This is a refiner that historically has always been four to six dollars per barrel in the total refining margins because of the sour crude mix, mostly as part of the business. As it jumps with these projects coming online to eleven dollars per barrel, you saw the company posted an absolutely fantastic quarter. Credit Suisse believes it's going to go to $15 per barrel based on the increased demand of the low sulfur fuel that's going to come from IMO 22. So yeah, I mean, that's what the projection, now you put this in the context, there's this massive buyer of $13 million worth of call options at the January 2021, 65 strike call options. There's 6,500 contracts there. It was zero until three, four weeks ago. Gradually continues to accumulate now $13 million bullish bet located at that particular strike. So yeah, there's a lot of big bulls betting on further upside in the group. Fair to say we'll be keeping an eye on these refiners. Absolutely. Fahad, there was some news this week that caught my attention that often goes unnoticed by investors. We know India is committed to buy $15 billion worth of new fighter jets. Either the F-16 from Lockheed Martin or the F-A-18 Super Hornet from Boeing. There was an air show in India this week, the Aero India in Bengaluru where Lockheed Martin surprised everyone by unveiling this F-21. It's a custom designed fighter jet just for India, and it looks clear that they've taken the lead to win this order. I see news like this. I see the secular uptrend of defense spending in the Trump administration after a five-year lull in the previous administration. I see Lockheed Martin trading 18% be below its 52-week high. It looks like defense stocks from here have a lot of room to run. What do you think? Oh, I absolutely agree. I think that uh, one of the one of the surprises that came out from 2018 was how terribly the sector lagged last year, um, which was quite surprising in many ways because this is one of the secular trends that have been in place ever since the current administration came to power. We had a five-year slump under Obama administration, and then the growth rate immediately in late 2016 turned from negative to positive and it has only accelerated since then. But despite all of that, 2018 was a bad year for all of these defense stocks and many of them are still trading 10 to 15 percent, in some cases 20 percent down from their 52 week high. I 100 percent agree that many of them, all of them in fact, will return to their prior 52 week highs. A point to add about the F-21, as Tom mentioned, the F-21 is, is, um, uh, is a upgraded version of F-16. F-16s are very popular with the Indian purchases in the past as well. This latest order that Indians are considering, which was already talked about and sort of already baked in, was, was $15 billion for 114 jets. The difficulty was that we didn't know whether the order will go to Lockheed F-16 or go to Boeing Super Hornet. But with this beefed up version that is now being called F-21 by Lockheed Martin, the chances are that Lockheed now has an upper hand and they will easily end up taking this particular order. Now, we do not know when the order will actually be announced, when it will come to power, but it's significant enough in my view that it should be net net positive for the stock which has already been in a strong recovery mode and currently actually forming a bull flag is starting to break out once again when I was looking at it last Friday's action. So I think this is clearly very positive news. 
There's another defense stock that we've reiterated our bull case multiple times lately too, Aerojet Rocketdyne, AJRD. There's another piece, big piece of news that came out last week that I think a lot of people may have missed. It has to do with hypersonic missiles. Here's a quote that caught my attention from Inside Defense Magazine. On February 15th, the Defense Department published a broad agency announcement for the time-sensitive target mission payloads demonstration seeking written proposals next month that will be followed by multiple contract awards for concept design studies this summer and capped by a two-year demonstration that kicks off by December. Your thoughts? Yeah, this is actually a significant news, but it's the kind of news because there was no numbers or dates attached to it. It sort of kind of like gets buried until it becomes you know, until it comes to the surface where it starts to become basis for model adjustments by the analyst community. Now, what's really happening over here is that, first of all, quick background, Aerojet Rocketdyne, um, uh, they are the absolute pure play on hypersonic missiles. Now, if you follow the pro procurement orders, the, the flow that is coming from Department of Defense, you will notice that there has been increasing amount of uh, uh, increasing amount of dollars being devoted by the defense budgets towards creating more and more kinds of hypersonic missiles. And it's sort of like a race, a quietly a race going on with Russia. Russia has been making heavy investments in hypersonic missiles and the U.S. were simply trying to play catch up along the same way. There was another stock in this group called Orbital ATK, symbol OK, that you may remember. You know, we wrote about this a while back and it ended up getting acquired. Aerojet rocket done is basically now the next play in that and I do believe this will get acquired sometime. What's really happening, what Inside Defense, that magazine is really uh, describing over here is that, uh, you know, the, the DOD, Department of Defense, is seeking new satellite network for long-range hypersonic strike targeting. The Pentagon is asking industry for ideas on a new satellite constellation optimized to identify fleeting, high-priority targets for attacks by conventionally armed hypersonic glide vehicles. Now, they're going to start taking orders of these, or at least demonstration of these, from companies like Aerojet, Rocketdyne, as well as others in the next couple months. And then the, the actual contract awards will begin after that. So, this is, an, this is why I wanted to bring this into this presentation as well, because right now nobody is modeling any upside from any of this. But I think if there is progress from between the demonstrations of these products and then you see follow through with Department of Defense, you know, contracts coming in, you could see this stock basically run right back to new 52 week high. Great. Thanks, Fahad. Any final thoughts for the audience? You know, next week is going to be full of catalysts. There's a lot of things that are going to happen, both at the macro level and in certain stocks and sectors that uh, should be of interest to all of us. Um, on the big political macro side of the things, uh, Cohen, Michael Cohen, the, Donald Trump's personal attorney, will be giving his first public open testimony in front of Congress. And I believe it's on Wednesday, but uh, I have to double check the date has been moved quite a few times. This is the first time when he is going to be in the public eye. Now, think of it this way. First of all, we have, we have absolutely no idea, you know, what's happening in this investigation in the background. So we can't even try to predict. But what we do know is that he is the personal lawyer. And we also know that he is going to jail. So what he's trying to do is basically cut his sentencing as much as possible. And this is the public testimony that's going to be in the public uh, hemisphere right. in front of Congress. So naturally, he's going to basically try to open up as much as possible, or at least that's the theory, in order to basically cut his sentence or bargain for a lower sentencing in the jail. So I have no idea what's going to come out of this, but there's always this wild card politically that something could just out of nowhere, it could just open up. So I think Wednesday is going to be an interesting day for that. Then we also have Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, that is going to be presenting twice, on Tuesday and on Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, these could be rather just a snoozing events. I don't expect much to come out from these because I think a lot of the discussion is now already baked in from the Federal Reserve acknowledging the growth, global slowdown is starting to impact businesses. And then as a, as a result, they've already moved farther and farther towards the dovish side. So I don't know what incrementally he could say 
that could uh, that could uh, create another spark, you know, in the market for any reason. But it's what he may not say or what how his words might be taken that may be taken the context now that the market has come back, maybe is potentially hawkish, that could basically turn to the downside. So generally, I'm not expecting much, but we'll see if there are any surprises there too. Then we have Friday, March 1st. That's what we have been discussing. 90-day ex, you know, extension of the deadline between U.S. and China trade talks is coming to end. So uh, no idea what will be the eventual outcome, but we have already presented the base case scenario is basically more oil exports and more, cru more uh, agricultural exports. So aside from that, no IP theft resolution there, no force transfer technology resolution there. We'll see. And then on the earnings front, my focus is actually on three stocks that I want, that I'm bullish on, and I'm expecting all three of them to post really strong earnings. Mercado Libre, they will be reporting earnings on Tuesday after market close. I think this could be one of those breakout quarters for the company. We'll see because Pagsegura Digital, which has a, you know, uh, uh, which has similar kind of uh, digital payments business and also a collaborative business with Mercado Libre, posted a very strong quarter last Friday and the stock was responded by going up 10%. Um, next one is Tandem Diabetes. This is one of our top picks from the Q1 outlook. The stock is already up 43% in the first quarter, so pretty remarkable gains. Um, I do expect they will report another blowout quarter. I think you're gonna see a good quarter from the company. That's on Tuesday, also on you know, February 26th after, after market close. And then the last one, another one from our Jaguar Q1 outlook called um, Thompson Router, symbol T-R-I. And they'll be reporting on Tuesday as well, this time, before market opens. Now, Thompson has a different bull case related to certain new law category launches they did last mm -hmm. year. So I think those, uh, those growth initiatives will continue to play out for a few more quarters. Great, great technical breakout over here as well. Has been steadily rising ever since the year started. All three companies bullish on, and I think they're gonna post good quarters. Excellent. We'll look forward to those earnings reports this week and what's sure to be another fun-filled, headline news-driven week. You bet. That's it from us, Jags. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much. See you next time.